वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून एंड वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल आर डियर व्यूअर्स आई एम डॉक्टर माधव स्मिता फ्रॉम द क्लिनिकल इंगेजमेंट टीम एट डॉक्टेक्ट वेलकम टू आर ब्रांड न्यू कार्डियक मास्टर सीरीज सेशन वी वुड लाइक टू एक्सटेंड अ स्पेशल थैंक्स टू डॉक्टर मनोज दुरैराज फॉर फेसिलिटेटिंग योर सपोर्ट टू द सीरीज ट्रांस कैथर एयोटिक बायल रिप्लेसमेंट इज एन एस्टेब्लिश ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ सीवियर सिम्टोमेटिक एयोटिक स्टेनोसिस इन पेशेंट्स ऑफ ऑल रिस्क कैटेगरी इट इज लेस इनवेसिव दैन ट्रेडिशनल प्रोसीजर बट प्रोड्यूसेज इक्विलेंट और सुपीरियर आउटकम To know more regarding the latest on TABR, we have with us a leading cardiac surgeon, Dr. Zainalupit Din Hamdulne, where he will discuss transcatheter aortic valve replacement. He is a leading cardiac surgeon and specializes in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. He has also done successful heart transplant surgeries and also performed 10,000 cardiac procedures. He is currently the chairman of Masina Heart Institute in Mumbai and the president of the Indian Association of Interventional Cardiac Surgeons. We welcome you sir to the platform it is a pleasure to host you today you may begin with your presentation good afternoon uh, my colleagues it's been a pleasure to talk on doplex and i'm very thankful for to uh, dr manoj raj who has taken an initiative to start this uh, master series and it's a privilege to talk on the, today's topic which is transcatheter aortic valve implantation i'm going to it's a, a very vast topic and is a very evolving topic so there are going to be certain i'm going to lag behind in my information at maybe at times but whatever is being documented has been put up here and i'm trying to cover the whole process procedure as much as possible so in case there are any questions we can take it at the end of the uh, sessions so to uh, begin uh, with my presentation uh, as i said i'm talking about transcatheter aortic valve implantation and i am myself dr hamdulai zainal abidin i am a cardiac thoracic surgeon and heart transplant surgeon as also an interventional cardiac surgeon as we call ourselves nowadays i am a chairman of a gsc hospital and and masina heart institute in mumbai so uh, so the, my presentations is going to uh, cover a brief history anatomy of uh, tavi specific indications contraindications which were currently evolving and uh, uh, i'll try to touch base on those evolving uh, indications and uh, while options technique uh, complications and where are we heading the future directions so why should you know about tavi remember uh, structural heart interventions are coming up in a big way and surgeons of the future need to be interventional surgeons it's very very important because we need to be with time as the technology is quickly evolving we, and as we are moving we are going to see much more interventions uh, than what we have even imagined so we need to be uh, ready and the surgeons need to be actively participate into it because uh, we have a better understanding of the anatomy of the heart and we can be a better interventionist uh, and of course it's it's a it's a uh, field where we all need to be together working upon for the betterment on uh, results of the procedures if you know that in the west a good number of tavis are performed by surgeons and you might be performing tavi some day and uh, so to deal with all the procedures and complications we need to have a thorough understanding of the subjects we are dealing with it is supposed to be a, a patient focused multidisciplinary heart team approach they are very very important all words it has to be patient focus and for to become a patient focus it has to be multidisciplinary and it has to be an heart team approach as you, as i mentioned before we have to have a perfect patient selections for the success of the procedure so it doesn't go into disrepute we have to have a perfect planning about the procedures and then uh, we impl implementation of the procedures and also equally important is the post operative care that we are going to uh, deal with uh, having doing this newer procedures is very very important the concept of uh, hybrid operation theaters and hybrid cath labs has to be introduced to see that this all procedures are now gets into the operation theaters and the operation theaters comes into the cath lab so that we are ready for any eventualities so the as i said we have to be patient focused in this current world giving the patient the best possible treatment and once we know that any then any a uh, lab is ready even for surgical intervention the procedure become much more safer and much more conf uh, confidence building for uh, uh, patient and uh, their willingness to undergo such procedures 
Now, taking a brief history, uh, this has just not started yesterday. This whole idea has been uh, exciting areas of research since 1960s. And the initial animal investigations were performed by Havel Davis in 1965 and Marlopoulos in 1971 by Phillips in 76 and uh, Matsubara in 1992. There was a this all gave a very temporary relief of aortic agitation. So the concept was uh, uh, built in uh, with an idea that we don't go for surgical intervention or give relief to a very morbid patients. It was in 1992 that Anderson and his team came up with a porcine model of transluminal stented heart valves. And uh, eventually it was uh, Dr. Alan Kribier who in 1988 did his first balloon aortic valvotomy. And, uh, but then this patient had a recurrence of uh, re in six to eight months. So there was something more had to be done. So he came up with, uh, in 1993, a uh, demonstrator in cadaveric heart that uh, a valve put across the aortic valve can give much better results and prevent any stenosis. And uh, as I said, I just need to take this down. So this was his first drawing. So they had, he had to be a, a very innovative brain because uh, the current concept of the Tavi Wal is completely based on his uh, first drawings that which he presented in 1994, conceptualizing Tavi. And uh, this is how he made the Tavi Wal. Uh, he had a catheter plus wall plus sheet across the wall. Then he, there was a sheet withdrawal and balloon inflation. These are the drawings from his uh, books, which has uh, uh, today's current concept of Tavi Wals. So first human implantations was done in 2002 and he was presented in uh, a journal uh, where uh, on April 16, 2002 at Charles Nicole University Hospital in Rouen, France. Uh, he did the uh, first intervention in a human uh, uh, in, in a human and apparently this patient was having a very very sick having tight out stenosis a lot of comorbidities and turned down by the surgical fraternity for any surgical intervention he had a bad peripheral vascular disease too unfortunately after implantation though it was very successful this patient did not make more than four months because he died because of sepsis and his uh, lower limb uh, 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 peripheral vascular disease resulting into amputations and so on. But then this was a floodgate or opening a gate to uh, this new arena of uh, transcatheter aortic wall implantation. And eventually they put up a paper of 40 cases very soon, uh, all uh, doing as uh, in uh, very um, uh, sick patients. Now, let us quickly have what is are the indications for TAVI and uh, what are the latest international guidance, guidelines say. Now, you should remember that TAVI should be undertaken with a multidisciplinary heart team, which is uh, highly recommended, including cardiologists, cardiac surgeon, and other specialists, if necessary. TAVI should be performed in hospital with cardiac surgical uh, facility. TAVI is indicated in patients with severe or symptomatic, uh, uh, in severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are not suitable for uh, surgical aortic wall replacement and as assessed by heart team and who are likely to gain improvement in the quality of life and to have a life expectancy of more than one year after consideration of their comorbidities. TAVI should be considered in high-risk patients with severe symptomatic AS who may still be suitable for surgery, but in whom TAVI is favored by a heart team based on individual risk profile and anatomic suitability. Now, as I said, what are the contraindications? Now, here I would say that, I put up a cautious note that the contraindications are fast wiping out because the uh, evolving technology. But having said that, the absence of a heart team and no cardiac surgery facility on the site is a no-no for conducting a TAVI program or performing a TAVI in those institutions as an alternative to AVR. And clinically, uh, you have to have a life expectancy more than one year. There has to be improvement of quality of life by TAVI, unlikely because of comorbidity. That's a contraindication. Even after doing TAVI, if the patient is not going to improve, then there is no point in doing a TAVI. It's a contraindication. Severe primary associated disease of other walls with major contributions to the patient's symptoms that can be treated only by surgery is a contraindication for, absolute contraindication for TAVI. 
Now, anatomically, if the annulus is very small, less than 18 millimeters, then there is a thrombus in left ventricle, there is active endocarditis, there is an elevated risk of coronary ostium obstruction, and uh, plug with mobile thrombi in the ascending out or arch, and excess transfemoral or subclavian approach, inadequate vaxillar excess are all uh, anatomical contraindications for doing a TAVI. Nowadays, uh, there is a, uh, these are relative contraindication. As I said, bicuspid aortic valve, which was a complete contraindication initially, we have started venturing into bicuspid valve also in certain types of bicuspid valve are now amenable for TAVI. Uh, untreated coronary artery disease and uh, hemodynamic instability, where the heart pumping is very, very poor, less than 15, 20 persons, and may not take any procedure. So the, and patients for transapical approach, which with severe pulmonary disease or LV apex not acceptable. These are the related contraindications for TAVI process, uh, TAVI program. Now, this has been given by um, uh, European Society of Cardiology. These are the indications. How, how are we going to manage uh, AS? Uh, when there are symptoms, uh, management of CA, severe AS with symptoms, if there are no symptoms, patients with uh, uh, ejection fraction less than 50%, then it is we have to go in for surgical intervention. If uh, there is uh, 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 no symptoms and LVF is more than 50% physically active, then we can still reevaluate this patient after the end of six months. But then uh, there are other uh, uh, factors like if the patient uh, has severe symptoms and medically not treatable, then and with uh, ejection fractions uh, less than uh, more than 50% CTS score, then these patients can be decided between SOUR and TOWER. These are the ECS and EACTS tower guidelines in, in which, as I said, the most important part, apart from repeating the same thing, which I have in the earlier slide, I put it up. TAVI is recommended in patients who are not suitable for SOUR as assessed by her team. This is very, very important. And we keep on forgetting this aspect because a heart team approach is must uh, for any TAVI programs to be successful and to be uh, uh, accountable, as I would say. These are uh, certain uh, uh, aspects which we need to, uh, need to look into it. So which are the aspect clinical characteristics which favor STAVI and which favor SOUR? STS score or Euro score uh, more than uh, less than four persons, the patient has to go for surgical intervention. And if the CTS score is uh, more than four percent, uh, then we the patients are for TAVI. And presence of uh, severe comorbidities, age less than uh, more than 75 years are TAVI candidates. Age, if it is uh, less than 75, is normally been uh, sent for uh, surgical intervention. But as I said, in an our Indian scenario, we are uh, uh, going far further on our age. We are lowering the bar uh, barrier to nearly 60s. We see patients uh, of 60 plus also being undertaken for TAVI. History of previous cardiac surgery, frailty index, which I will uh, talk in my further slides, and uh, suspicion of endocarditis, then we have to go for SOUR. But if the patient is very frail and there is uh, restricted mobility and conditions, and uh, then we should think about TAVI. Now, uh, from anatomical and technical aspect, we have to look around for favorable anatomy is important. Porcelain aorta, presence of intact coronary bypass grafts, uh, which are at risk when I can perform a sternotomy or uh, there is going to be an expected patient prosthesis mismatch by surgical interventions or there is a severe chest deformity or scoliosis. These are the patients which should go in for uh, uh, TAVI, the tower rather than uh, surgical intervention. These are AHA guidelines, which have now dis distinguished as low surgical risk, intermediate, uh, intermediate surgical risk, high surgical risk, and prohibitive surgical risk. Now, patient with low surgical risk, there is no question, there is no doubt, they should go for surgical aortic wall replacement. They are much better results. And patients with intermediate surgical risk, then we can think about class 2A. If they fall, then we can think about tower, and then otherwise we, they can be looked for surgical AVR. And high risk surgical risk, then we can think about uh, uh, surgical AVR or they can go in for tower. But in prohibitive surgical risk, those patients are meant for tower only. These are again the same thing, which uh, according to AHA guidelines, so the contraindications for TAVI. 
Now, to perform a Tavi is very, very important and it's mandatory that you understand, assume, uh, imagine the aortic annulus, everything at is at the aortic annulus. So you have to have a thorough information and knowledge about the aortic annulus. So what are the important aspects? You have to know the annulus diameter. You have to know the height of coronary ostia from the annulus. You have to know uh, the sinotubular junction, the size of sinotubular junction, the height of uh, sinus of valserva. Uh, diameter at uh, sinus of ulcerva and the diameter of ascending aorta. These are the certain important aspects that one has to know before going in for uh, 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 TAVI, in, in, uh, for TAVI, for a surgery from, from the intervention point of view. So the relations of uh, left ventricular outflow tract to aorta differs between elderly and younger patients with more in uh, elderly patients. It is more 90 to 120 degrees being encountered in the elderly group. And for the purpose of uh, transcatheter aortic implantations, aortic annulus corresponds to virtual ring formed uh, by the nadir of all the three leaflet attachment. That is very important, we should know. And uh, so this is what a certain anatomical uh, aspect we should know before uh, venturing into TAVI. Now, there are equally important is the pre-procedure investigations. Currently, the CT coronary and uh, CT autogram is one of the most important aspects uh, uh, a patient has to undergo before uh, taking up TAVI. Whether the patient is eligible for TAVI, whether the patient is a good candidate for TAVI, all depends upon uh, the information that we gather, gather from uh, CT, uh, multi-slice, ECG-gated uh, computer tomography or CT scan. And uh, rest of the other things like TE has just become an addendum to the whole procedure because TE, if we can put, we can know the post-operative uh, complications like paravalvular leak can be very well evaluated at that minute. So TE has been now restricted to only uh, um, uh, how we go about uh, with the uh, uh, post-operative uh, management of complications. But then to perform a TAVI, we need to have a fair in, in a knowledge and information and reading about uh, the uh, CT autogram with the aortic annulus as well as the periphery. It has to be a complete CT study. So what do we look into uh, CT scan? We need to see the atherosclerotic burden, the vessel tortuosity or bending calcifications and the diameters of the annulus and the aorta at different level, as well as the approach arteries. Now, this is one of the very important aspects of TAVI, skin to valve analysis. This is very important. Skin to valve analysis means that right from where the, you're going to take a prick where your wire is going to be introduced into for especially for transfemoral or for any access for that matter is very 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 important this assessment is must otherwise you will be ending up in more complications or by while doing a, a tavi so as i said there are various things which show this picture shows. So your uh, uh, common iliac, the common femoral diameter, the ascending aorta, the descending aorta, the wall annulus, the whole study has to be done. Nowadays, we have a, a something called as three-man show, uh, which uh, is a computer gen app generated information, which gives a complete detailed analysis of the annulus from the wall and the three-dimensional imaging of the whole aorta based on this CT scan. Now, what do we need to see about access route de uh, decisions? As time is going on, the sheets were much bigger and then they have slowly been evolved into a much smaller and making much simpler for the wall delivery system. But then we need to know the size of the uh, access so that our delivery system can be properly chosen. So these are the certain things we need to know. Now, what is it recommended is we have to have... Uh, a complete vascular as access assessment of pelvic arteries or aorta, and when not contraindicated of the dye. We have to have a measurement of vessel dimensions. And from this reconstructed image, the minimal luminal diameter along the axis has to be determined. Otherwise, we can go at the site and above, if we find that the, access, uh, the uh, artery has become smaller, then we may get stuck and we may try to negotiate through it. We may cause uh, severe uh, vascular complications. So to prevent this, we have to know the whole access 
the whole travel journey of the valve through the uh, from the art from the access artery right into the aorta into the arch and the ascending aorta right up to the valve has to be completely assessed before we start the procedure. The left ventricle should be evaluated for the presence of thrombus, and if there is, then transapical access route is out of consideration. So, as I said, these are very important information. Now, equally important, remember that this concept has to be also borne in mind that what we are putting, even for as a surgeon, we, the natural anatomy is not circular, is not, uh, but then we have to make this annulus and circular because the valve which we are deploying are always becoming, circular, especially the balloon mounted valves makes the annulus circular. So this also we should remember in mind because uh, we are going to deal with calcium into the aortic annulus. As I said, uh, what is another important aspect to know when we are doing a TAVI is to know the coronary osteal height from the annular plane. Here, as I, you can see, I don't I do have a projection here. So this height of the left main from the, uh, from the annular and the right also, this is left main, this is right. So we need to know the uh, heights of the uh, openings of the coronary osteum because uh, we don't want them to be obstructed when we are implanting a valve. So aortic annulus measurement <clears throat> is very important. Now, what is uh, what I'm trying to say here is it is just not only the circular. We need to know the anterior posterior diameters and uh, the lateral di diameters because those are completely different. As I said, the wall is never circular. So determination of aortic annulus, uh, annulus is very important. And uh, they, as I said, their area can be measured and diameter can be assessed from the different things. And uh, uh, the diameter can be derived from the circu circumference, again, assuming that the annulus is not circular. So measurements in a coronal or sagittal reconstruction is not important, is not acceptable. You have to have a complete uh, uh, diameter measured in a three-dimensional way. Now, that is what is important. A comprehensive CT analysis for TAVI is key to successful outcome. So this is a very important statement. Comprehensive CT analysis of TAVI is key to successful uh, uh, outcome. Now, based on all those things, I'm just going to recapitulate what exactly we need to see from the CT data. Now, from the data, what you know, we have to have a good image quality. We have to have uh, timing of images mostly in systolic rather than diastolic. So whatever measurement we do, we do in a systolic mode. Then the, in the aorta, we look for presence of kinking, presence, presence of intraluminal obstructions, presence of intraluminal thrombi. In ascending aorta, we look for the width of what uh, at 40 millimeter from the annulus. We need to know the ascending aorta, which will give you a fair idea of the whole size. But important is uh, 40 millimeter from the annulus, we need to know the width of ascending aorta. Position relative to sternum. In the aortic arch, we need, need to know again the width and the branch anatomy for embolic protection device purposes. In uh, descending aorta, again, the width should be uh, determined and look out for any free floating uh, thrombi and iliofemoral arteries, minimal width on both the side, tortuosity, calcification. About the aortic root, we need to know the sinotubular junction aortic diameter, sinus of valsalva width, sinus of valsalva height, distance of coronary ostia from the aortic annulus, uh, the aortic wall cuspidity, whether they are tricuspid, whether they are bicuspid, and uh, whether they are monocuspid, so that we know that what is the contraindications and which in which cases we should not do TAVI. Uh, qualitative extent of aortic wall calcification from commissures and annulus, presence of severely calcified cusp is very important because this is the calcium which can be pushed into the coronary ostium and uh, block the coronary arteries. So we need to know the aortic annulus, the aortic annulus uh, uh, in short diameters, in long diameters, then we have to have uh, derived the area from this uh, measurements and then the circumference also. And in left ventricle, we need to know the presence of thrombies. When we are using a, a balloon expandable processes, then normally we can do a 10 to 20 percent of oversizings uh, related to the aortic annulus. This plan oversizing helps the, so that the process uh, to hold the processes because this is sutureless. And in addition, they assume a circular shape irrespective of annulus. 
And uh, but in self count expanding platforms, the they mold the native annulus anatomy. But for uh, balloon inflatable uh, valves, uh, we are making the valves into circular. So the calcium is very important to hold the sutureless valve. So in summary, for, for TAVI decision making, you know, we have to know the risk criteria. Uh, we have already discussed Euroscore. At present, TAVI is recommended only for high risk patients, both in AHA and ESC guidelines. But slowly, slowly, the recommendations are coming down to uh, low risk, moderate risk also, because now it has gone down to say that the patient has opted for it. But then at the end of the day, from a clinical point of view, we should restrict TAVI only for high risk cases. Uh, anatomical criteria we just discussed, patient criteria, comorbidity, comorbidities are frequent in typical population which are considered for TAVI because it is normally in a patients uh, in recommended after 75 years. So these patients have a lot of other problems. So multidisciplinary assessment of the patient has to be taken into it. And that's the whole uh, place where heart team concept comes into it, where cardiac surgeons, cardiac anesthetists, cardiologists, general cardiologists, physicians, imaging specialists, geriatricians, and other people have to be involved, like nephrologists and neurologists, because we see uh, even AKI as a neurological complication post-AVI. So we, uh, when a patient comes to you, we have the whole team who can cater to their needs. These are the other things which also we need to look into, the frailty index, which is very objective, but uh, you know we have to look for whether the patient is very frail and uh, cannot take surgical intervention, then we need to... Uh, uh, them to go uh, push them for TAVI procedures. The futility index, these are uh, patients at extreme risk who have a very limited lifespan, less than one year, then there is no point in being very uh, aggressive in uh, uh, in treating them because this is one of the contraindications for doing any procedure, whether it is surgical or TAVI. Uh, we have to be un uh, understanding the futility index. And as well as uh, operator and institutional criteria are important. It has been seen that, uh, uh, and by recommended by partner uh, trial, that people at least have to, uh, the, perform, the operator has done at least 25 uh, to 30 cases in uh, balloon uh, uh, cases and uh, balloon implantable uh, transfemoral cases and around 35 to 45 cases to become a real operator uh, in transapical cases. Uh, you, till then, I think uh, there is always uh, a learning curve so that's a fair learning curve required. But uh, nowadays, as I said, the, with the evolution of better sheets and gadgets, the uh, learning curve is uh, sharp decreasing and is completely gadget dependent. I see the technicians or the company people taking through the operators and uh, how about to go right from wall implantations, the angle of wall implantations. Uh, so eventually this whole process, one fine day is going to be AI dependent and uh, the AI will tell you how to go about and which uh, 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 view to go whether the wall implantation is proper, proper or not and that's the reason I say that eventually everybody should be able to do such procedures. You have to have a fair knowledge about uh, TAVI hardware before you have to uh, put yourself into TAVI program. Uh, you have to know the various type of bioprosthetic valve because mechanical valves are not yet used uh, so far in TAVI procedures. Uh, we never know. And uh, you need to know the delivery system, the loading system, the deployment met uh, methods, uh, in, in inflatable platforms, and uh, other ancillary devices, uh, sheets, guide wires, and balloons. You have to have a perfect knowledge about uh, all this before uh, you uh, go in for a TAVI program. Now, so certain your I think I've just cut off the videos because they just take a long time. Uh, there are uh, these are balloon versus self expandable. You can see in A, B, and C this is uh, balloon expandable valve, and the D, E, and F uh, image is showing uh, self expandable valve. There is an advantage and disadvantage. And quickly, we'll in later slide we can go in and uh, cover that part of it. So the sheets, as I said, they have progressively reduced in size uh, from 24, 26 French, that was to 14 to 16 French for balloon expandable, as well as literally to six millimeter for self-expanding processes. 
Now guide wires, all the wires for Tavi are uh, now become more than 260 millimeter length because uh, we need long length guide wires to keep and keep on changing them one over the other. And uh, all are soft tape, uh, distal automatic to prevent any form of LP perforations. The balloons are length are now four to five centimeters so as to provide an adequate length uh, to uh, uh, across the valve so that we are keep, keeping a balanced uh, um, ballooning of the aortic valve and can be ballooned to four to six atmosphere and the newer generation valve can be implanted directly. Devices available, there are uh, currently 12 percutaneous prosthetic aortic valves out of which four are uh, uh, transapical and uh, rest eight are transfemoral and uh, most out of which eight I think are uh, C approved and two are FDA approved. So we see mostly, and but major of the chunk is taken in India by uh, Merrill My Valve and then uh, Edwards and Medtronic and about these are the major player in our uh, uh, country with uh, different types of uh, valves, which I will not venture too much. But then I'll just take the basic of TAVI procedure. So we have uh, first generation valves. Now we are moved to second generation valves and third generation valves, which are making the things easier deployment, better opposition, less complications, lower profiles. They are retrievable now, higher durability and uh, dedicated. Now we can go in for biker speed valves and nanotechnology is coming in, smaller sheets. So, so many innovations are happening every day. Every time a company comes with a new uh, sheet, a new, uh, yeah, it's like vehicles, cars, which are, been upgraded uh, now and then. Today we are talking about EVs and already we have started talking about hydrogen cell uh, vehicles. The so same thing, Tavi is moving in a similar fast pace. Now this is one of the uh, valves which is uh, used in our uh, uh, for Tavi, a Sapien 3 valves. I have used uh, quite a few, so I'm putting it up. I've used quite a few of my valves also. So those are the two valves I'm focusing because my experience in self-expandable is lesser than balloon expandable. So this is the Metronic core valves, uh, what I put it up here. They are, they are useful for smaller annuli. Uh, between 18 to 20 millimeters um, and it can be deployed supra annular so it gives a better size valve in these cases. Uh, so St. Jude has Portico, they have uh, navigated, they have launched a newer valve also. Uh, Abbott has come up with a newer valve. So as newer valves are coming into the market every time now and then. So this is my valve. My valve has its own advantage. It is much better priced into the Indian market and uh, it is a balloon expandable valve. It's a bovine pericardial trileaflet valve with a better cell size and uh, better uh, uh, maneuverability. And uh, so, I mean, they are currently uh, have a fair share into the Indian market with uh, for Tavi valves. Now, the other good thing about it is uh, they have these markers which help us to really place the valve properly. So that second dense row uh, shows us the landing zone of the valve. So we can pro properly uh, placement of the my valve can be done. These are certain uh, valves <clears throat> which are out of market, which was balloon expandable valve. Sorry, excuse me. And we must have heard about Jena valves, which was specially used for aortic valves. So all the time I'm talking about uh, Tavi for aortic stenosis, but we are, won't be uh, surprised oh, very soon. We will be getting more valves for uh, aortic regurgitations too. There are challenges for AR valves to, Tavi valves to be put for AR, but then uh, there are certain valves which are in under development and which are coming, uh, coming up fast for, uh, for aortic regurgitation too. So this is some Lotus edge valve, and this is accurate uh, uh, aortic bioprocesses. And this is engager technology because this is for transapical use where the valve can be held because of its uh, 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 balloon shape uh, lower down and a polyester skirt, which is there, which is self-expanding metanol frame. Now, let us go quickly go through the procedure that is equally important for people who are keen in pursuing TAVI program. Now, very basic information I'm trying to give you. So it, most of the cases now are done in conscious uh, uh, awake sedations uh, with that uh, 
a patient really under requiring a general anesthesia. Earlier, most of the cases were done under general anesthesia, but now it's the conscious sedation is the terminology on which uh, the most of the procedures are done. And um, we have to give pre-procedural as routine uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, which is very important. Uh, Access-wise, both the femoral, if you're going for a transfemoral, both femorals are required uh, from normally we look for right-sided for the main delivery system uh, to transfer the wall. But in case if the right sides walls uh, arteries are not fairly good size, then we can always sh uh, shift over to the left side and use the right side for just a pigtail catheter. Apart from then, we have to have a venous access for uh, uh, for uh, pacing the heart. And uh, that is what I'll cover in my next slides. So as I said, uh, heparin is administered to target an ACT of 250 to 300. They should always be image assisted. The puncture has to be image assisted to ensure that the puncture point is in common femoral artery is very, very, very important, especially for uh, where we are going to put up our delivery system. Uh, because if you go to uh, superficial femoral or after bifurcation, then you may find a smaller artery and may, may end up in a complication. So what we do normally is take an anti-grade contrast, put it from the left system, put up pigtail catheters and, uh, and uh, cannulate the right-sided innominate artery and take a shoot and exactly find out the site of our puncture. And then using a micropuncture set, we use the puncture uh, exactly uh, on the head of uh, uh, femoral uh, uh, femur and then... Uh, uh, that's the best site for uh, our delivery system introductions. The left side is used to uh, later on a pigtail catheter is put to know the uh, to do an autogram and see the exact site of the cusp and for uh, uh, implanting uh, our valve. It helps us to give exact placement of our valve. And uh, so pre closure uh, right now. I've just put this slide much before than the rest of the procedure because it's not only about, you know, when you say that you want a patient to walk outside uh, the cath lab, that is what how we promote a TAVI, that it is a, a procedure where a patient can go home in two days' time, then uh, we try to avoid any surgical cutdowns of the femoral artery unless it is mandatory or necessary. In that case, then uh, there are per-closure devices, uh, which are uh, that known as ProGlide, and there are per close and there are different types of devices which are coming in. A single proglide is more than enough. Earlier we used to use two proglide, but nowadays I use a single, single proglide for uh, for femoral artery closure. Uh, there was a uh, video demonstrating a proglide, but I think um, we'll leave it for some other date, uh, which helps into percutaneous closure of the femoral axis so that we don't have to do a surgical cut down on these patients. Sheath insertion. Uh, initially is done on a stiff guide wire, which allows the insertion of, of a TAVI sheet by providing support and strengthening any iliofemoral toxicity. So whenever you're passing a sheet, see that it is passed on a stiff guide wire. And uh, for challenging anatomy due to peripheral vascular disease, an expandable sheet is, uh, is helpful. Now, my valve has used this uh, Python 14 French expandable introduced sheet. It has a semi uh, a circular or it has an opening on one side or a slit so that this can expand it as we are passing the valve inside. So graded expansion of the femoral artery, which helps the passage of a bigger size valve through the smaller size femoral arteries uh, on the iliac arteries. So the majority of processes <clears throat> require on-table preparations. Where basically, the size has already been pre-decided by, by taking the various uh, 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 diameters on the CT scan. And it's just a question of last minute decisions, which what which exact wall size has to be taken. But as I said, mostly it's pre-decided exact wall size. Balloon inflatables normally has a 10 to 20% uh, over inflation uh, uh, chances. And uh, self-inflatable platforms normally uh, conquer to the size of the annulus. Uh, we need to have, this is all certain uh, armamentarium which is required for balloon inflatable. We have to, we need a, uh, uh, 
what you say, a uh, crimper, which we can crimp the valve and put it into, uh, and it can be implanted or uh, loaded on a balloon so that uh, it can pass through as a loaded uh, valve into the aorta and across the annulus, and then the balloon has to be expanded. Now, most important apparent in this whole thing is temporary pacemaker implantation. So the on the contralateral side, other than your where the sheath is, on the other side, we use a femoral vein axis and passed uh, temporary pacing wire, normally a balloon uh, inflatable uh, temporary pacing wires, which help us to uh, pace the heart. Rapid pacing has to be done when we are implanting a valve or we are doing a balloon dilatation of the valve. So the most challenging part in uh, TAVI is crossing the valve. Uh, you have to be somewhere here. It's where we say that luck, uh, uh, lady luck has to be by your side. I'm not talking about precious lady, uh, pretty ladies, but I'm talking about lady, uh, uh, lady luck by your side. Sometimes you can just pass this uh, wire in five minutes and I've seen struggling for an hour to just cross the valve using different type of, but then, uh, most of 99% of the times or maybe 100% of time nowadays, you are able to uh, pass the wire across the aortic wall in spite of his cal cal calcium load. And uh, with the newer uh, uh, ways, technologies, we can exactly find wire exactly is uh, opening. And with experience, you know how to go about. So you can use various amplitude catheter. Uh, you can use uh, uh, AL uh, you can use uh, J catheter. So depending upon what type of wall we are uh, trying to uh, cross over, uh, we can use it, keep on changing the wires. So Jitkin's right can be used, internal memory uh, catheters uh, to cross across. And the pictorial catheter is placed in the non-coronary sinus of Falsalva and the aortic root angiography is taken to determine the position of the uh, valve relative to the cusp. And uh, annu uh, the aortic annular plane has to be proper so that it's perpendicular to the wall devices. And uh, we take just a shoot to know that where exactly we are uh, positioning the valve. So here is the what uh, video of was a video of uh, uh, crossing the wires. And it's a straight uh, AL catheter is what we are using. And we cross uh, once we cross this, then we change it over with a tougher wire, stiffer wire, and then we uh, change it to a wire with a curved tip so that there is no injury to our uh, uh, coin the wire, so there is no injury to our left ventricle. So many times we have to do a pre-dilatations of the aortic valve to allow the proper access of the so we can go ahead and quickly do a pre-dilatation of the valve just enough to let our uh, valve uh, cross through the uh, uh, calcified valve and uh, proper placement. And then uh, many times if the uh, this calcium is not very bad, the annulus is good, then we can directly go and do a placement of the valve uh, uh, without doing a pre-dilatations. Uh, Many uh, seasoned uh, operators nowadays can go ahead and just do a direct implantation of the valve. Uh, because uh, the problems that many times we see with balloon dilatations is uh, there can be uh, calcium chunks released from there or calcium, calcium embolization from the valve resulting into neurological complications. Uh, so positioning of the wall is equally important. Correct implantation depth is a critical feature of successful implantations. An accurate implantation of prosthetics wall requires visualizations of both the aortic annulus plane and that of the device delivery catheter over, and it has to be perpendicular place. Now, coaxility of the prosthesis and delivery system and the center of the uh, wall is important. Aortic root angulation is also equally important. More than 90 to, uh, or less than 45 degrees make processes deployment uneven. What I mean to say is the angle is too high and your placement is not proper. Then your angle is, your wall is sitting at an angle, which is not the right way to put it. So we have to be sure that your angulation of the delivery system and the annulus is at perpendicular level. And traditionally, there are two methods used to determine that the device is coaxial with the annulus is to know the line of perpendicularity method or the center line method. These are two ways which we divide, decide how to place the valve. 
here is another <clears throat> known as uh, S curve, double S curve uh, te technique. So a more accurate system has been developed, which can be applied to all TAVI systems and involves the use of fusion or pluro and a CT to create a double S curve. In essence, this is where the annulus and delivery systems perpendicularity curves intersect. And this will frequently be with the RAO quadrant projections uh, uh, as opposed to more traditional, what normally what we put a valve, implant a valve with an LAO cranial, but here we can put in an RAO cranial with a double S curve techn technique. Now, as I said, uh, we have to go for a rapid uh, uh, pacing when we are implanting a valve, which prevents uh, you know, the reason why we need to do rapid pacing also, I'll tell you, which uh, because a systolic uh, uh, movement can displace a wall or push the wall further. So we have to remove the systolic movement and that's why we pace it properly. It also prevents a lot of uh, complications of perforations and ruptures of the annular. So, and we have to see that the pressures have dropped down it can be done uh, in this case, initial two is to one capture is followed by delayed one is to one capture with a greater fall in arterial pressures. Now, post wall deployment is very important because we have to assess for paravalvular leak because as I said, this is an uh, wall which is not circular. So we are making it circular and it's a calcified wall. Certain amount of calcium may push the wall, deform the wall, resulting into some sort of paravalvular leak. So we have to know the AR index, which can be calculated uh, by uh, checking the diastolic blood pressure with the LVEDP. Uh, minus LVDP with systolic blood pressures into 100 and uh, a value less than 25 imply a good prognosis with a mortality at one year uh, versus uh, 40 uh, with uh, if a value is more than 25 uh, at one year and the P and it's a significant mortality that we see with the that there is a significant paravalvular leak many times in <clears throat> In uh, balloon inflatable valves, we need uh, uh, we can go up to 25% is needed in 25% of the cases post dilatations. If you find that there is some sort of paravalvular leak, you can go ahead and uh, over inflate the valve by 10 to 15% or 20% to see that the um, valve is fitting properly into the annulus. Uh, in case of uh, uh, self infla inflammable uh, implantable walls uh, expandable walls we can retrieve the walls and reposition it but in case of balloon implant implantable walls we we are done when we implant we expand the wall that's it so hemostasis and vessel closure is equally important because most of the time the complications of tavi is not at the wall level but at the surgical uh, inter at the excess site so anticoagulation in post tavi is uh, early post procedures. Many you know, uh, the European guidelines says that aspirin of eighty one, clopidogrel of seventy five for three to six months, and if war if patient is in AF or a patient otherwise needs warfarin, then we don't need either of them or just give an aspirin, uh, eighty one milligram indefinitely. And AH guidelines say that aspirin of 75 to 100 milligram plus clopidogrel 75 milligram for six months and for long term basis aspirin of 75 to 100 milligram indefinitely. So alternative access also we should know in case if we get stuck with femoral then we need to know about alternate access sites. I'm just going to mention you the names that we can go through subclavian or transaxillary. We can go transaortic, we can go transcarotid, we can go transapical, and now we can go even transcable. So this is a different ways to approach uh, access for tali and now uh, our transeptal. So quickly about complications of tali, we have cardiovascular complications, we have non-cardiovascular complications. So we see, we'll quickly go through each complications in this way. So most common complications, what we see on table is the paravalvular like PVLs. The potential mechanism for PVLs include heavy calcification, malpositioning, and uh, dysfunctions of the leaflet, a very elliptical annulus, uh, bicuspid wall, which we have not properly uh, pre-prepared and a small a uh, wall relative to the annular size and under expanded wall. These are all causes for PVL. If it is under, under expanded walls, we can always go and over expand it by 10, 20 percent to see. Unless uh, even that is not helping, then we go in wall in wall and over expand the bigger, put up a bigger size wall. While first generation prosthesis wall together uh, with the reliance, uh, we were 
what we need to do is an echocardiographic image it and check for uh, uh, the aortic annulus and the parvular leak. And if it is there, we need to fix it there and there. Uh, we can't come out uh, uh, with a parvular leak. Normally, with the newer generation was there is a, a not much of a parvular leak. In case if there is a parvular leak, then we need to go in and fix with uh, plugs wherever there is a leak. Uh, if the mechanism is wall malposition, then a second wall in wall procedure is warranted. If the leak is due to under expansion, then post dilatation is warranted. Prevention of parvular, uh, paravalvular regurgitation requires the processes uh, confirmable. Hence, accurate annular dimensions has to be determined before the procedure. So, second generation TAVI wall designs have helped to mitigate against such uh, moderate or severe regurgitation compared to first generation walls. The second complications we come across is stroke. The mechanism for this is uh, because of periprocedural complication embolizations. And to prevent this also now we have got uh, newer devices, which I'll talk in my next slide quickly. And in case if it is there, then we have to involve a neurosurgeon neurologist in case if uh, it can be uh, treated, the debris can be retrieved and uh, uh, we can put some filters in there. The challenge, I suppose, has fueled the development of cerebral protection devices that either deflect the debris away from the head and neck vessels or capture material in total. Nowadays, they are uh, commercially available. There are various ones like TriGuard, Umbrella. These are certain uh, filters for preventing embolic episodes. So uh, you can see there are quite a few in the market now. We can use it and... Uh, there can be conduction abnormalities, so atrial fibrillation. One third of patients with increased left atrial pressure, transapical approach uh, uh, are certainly independent predictors for atrial fibrillation. So we have a temporary pacemaker wire already introduced during the procedure for rapid pacing. We can leave that for next 12 hours to 24 hours to see that there is no uh, uh, conduction problems post uh, TAVI procedure. And then in case if it is there, then we can supplement it with a permanent pacemaker later on. Otherwise, uh, if there are no problems during the TAVI procedures, we can now remove the TAVI, uh, temporary pacing wires immediately. Uh, as I said, the predictors for the need for permanent pacemakers are pre-existing LBBB and less ex left axis deviation, right bundle bunch block. Uh, the thickness of the non-coronary leaflet, these are certain things which can result into, uh, these are the predictors for patients uh, who may end up with uh, conduction blocks. So depth of implantation is, uh, only, is the only modifiable factor here. So we can just, just change the depth of how we are implanting it, uh, which can uh, prevent any uh, bundle branch blocks. The vascular injury, as I said, most of the complications, nearly a range of 5 to 23 persons are excess site complications. And nowadays with even proglide and everything is much better. Uh, and here is where a surgeon is very important. So see that in case if with the slightest doubt that there is a, a vascular complication, then it has to be addressed immediately and taken care of. Uh, if there is a dissection, minor dissections, so like you know, last case I had, then we can just inflate the balloon and keep it for some time. And then normally that takes care of such uh, dissections, uh, which is there locally. Uh, you can see certain complication in case if there is a rupture or something, then there are uh, uh, available endovascular stent, cover stents can be put and the dissections can be taken, uh, the ruptures can be taken care of. The other uh, uh, complication which uh, uh, operator is very concerned about is coronary obstructions or occlusions. Now, coronary obstruction is a critical complications and uh, needs to be uh, addressed immediately. The heights of the osteos are variable in, in anatomy, and that is why we need to know uh, the height of coronary osteo from the annulus for the placement of the valve. Anything which is less than 10, 10 to 12 millimeters now are, uh, can cause obstructions, and we have to be ready for it with uh, uh, stents already introduced into it to prevent sort of uh, uh, any uh, complications. Uh, we can pre-place a stent into the left main and do the procedures or... Uh, 
and normally the coronary obstructions are usually seen in wall in wall procedures more than normal routine procedures. So you have to just pick it up in case there is an immediate unexplained hypotension, CCG changes, then you quickly have a look at it. And in case uh, if it is uh, not retrievable, then this needs a surgical intervention. You can see this wall is literally abutting, the only flat it abutting the left main and shut it down. In such cases, then we have to take this patient uh, surgically if you are not able to immediately open it up uh, in the cath lab itself. Pericardial effusions and tamponade is another complication which is very uh, rarely seen nowadays uh, but then we have to have all these things in, uh, in mind because basically when we are using a stiff wire we have to be very careful that we don't perforate the left ventricle. So handling of the wires is equally important. So any uh, thrusting of the wires can result in per uh, wires perforating the LV and coming out. Uh, aortic annular or root ruptures, very rarely seen, but normally seen in case of balloon dilatations and never seen in uh, self-expandable valves. And uh, it should, uh, it is a catastrophe. Then uh, to salvage such patients become very difficult. They should be immediately shifted. And that is why the need for hybrid OR in such cases, if there is something we can just uh, immediately put the patients and pump there and there and go and retrieve the valve, remove it and do a, a root, a root uh, salvaging procedures. Other less uh, frequent complication that we see is mal wall malpositioning or wall embolizations, wall dysfunctions while thrombosis, uh, while endocarditis and delayed embolisms. So these are other less frequent complications that. So the non-cardiac complications, as I said, can be acute kidney injury because of dye. But recently we have been doing uh, TAVI with a very, very minimal dye wherever it is necessary. Otherwise, uh, the whole procedures can be done in uh, 100 to 200 uh, cc of dye. But even such cases, a small amount of dye also can cause acute kidney injury and that needs to be taken care of. There can be hemolysis because of patient processes mismatch and sepsis and radiations. These are the other things which need to. So where do we really, where does TAVI or TOWER stand today? The partner three trial, everything looks to be hunky-dory here. So among low-risk patients with aortic stenosis, TOWER was superior, uh, preventing death, stroke, or, or re-hospitalization. Re -hospitalization. TOWER was also associated with a lower incidence of stroke uh, than uh, an atrial fibrillation, than surgical intervention. TOWER was also associated with a larger improvement in quality of life compared with SOUR. There was a numerical increase in the need for a new permanent pacemaker within 30 days in TOWER in 6.5% against uh, SOUR, which is 4%, so not significant. And very mild uh, parvular <coughs> AR occurred because of uh, TOWER, so because of the newer walls are now with cusp, uh, with the uh, uh, cuffs which are which can prevent any paravalar leak. So partner th three was very promising, saying that TOWER is eventually going to change the whole scenario. Regarding sapient three and core wall, I didn't want to go into that part of it because it's a completely, but then uh, it's uh, uh, based on different type of annulus. We can select a valve uh, based on what is best for this uh, the patient. So there are newer advances in TAVI. We are looking of TAVI in uh, surgical valves, which are degenerated. They are coming in a big way, uh, especially in mitral positions. We are using sapien, I mean, we are using balloon expandable valves and aortic valves, which have already undergone uh, so bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement have degenerated. We can go in and put up a now uh, tower in SOUR. So these are certain uh, patients with uh, where we have put a tower in a surgical valves, previous surgical degenerated mitral wall bioprosthesis, and then uh, it functions pretty well. And it is quick procedures with minimal complications. So in uh, as we say that we are looking now in the newer arena of uh, aortic regurgitations. All the time we have been talking about aortic stenosis, but the newer generation valves are coming in like Jenna wall, which are for now aortic regurgitations. If they're Recently, we they have been we have been putting into aortic regurgitation, but with some sort of calcium calcium load there, which helps to hold the wall at that positions. Uh, so these are certain tricks to put up a uh, in aortic. So what are the various devices are in pipeline or currently uh, for transfemorals and Trinity valves, Colibri valve, Innovare, Optimum. So there are a lot of thing, innovations happening, a lot of things to come inside. As I said, this uh, this 
arena is really, really moving fast. Um, a lot of uh, developments, a lot of innovations are coming in. So that's all about Tavi for today, I suppose. I think I just took your script with the whole procedures. Uh, but at the end of the whole thing, I would say that uh, we need to uh, really uh, actively participate in TAVI program because this is a technology of future as of today for aortic valve. But uh, as we are seeing that the uh, interventions are going to come in for mitral valve, mitral clips are already in place. There are valves which are being developed for intervention for mitral valves, uh, tricuspid valve, the trick valves and others. So uh, intervention is going to be the way in future and uh, uh, with uh, the gadgets, with AI coming in, the whole procedure is going to become very, very safe, very uh, standardized mm -hmm. and uh, in a, of, can be performed by uh, uh, in operators with a very basic skills and can really quickly take it over. So as I said, this is eventually going to become a uh, operator, uh, uh, AI dependent or a technician dependent procedures. So it's uh, right to say that the surgeons, the cardiologists, the operators uh, should actively uh, take participate into TAVI programs and uh, you know, uh, as it is a need of future. Thank you very much. It was great listening to you, sir. Very well presented. You bring an entirely new perspective to TAVR. We have a few questions from the audience. With your permission, let's go to the first question. What imaging modalities are used for patient selection, procedural planning, and guidance during TAVR? As I mentioned in one of the slides, uh, that to currently the CT autogram with a complete uh, skin to knee, uh, skin to valve uh, assessment. Uh, is a very, very, very important modality to decide, to pre-decide which, if that the patient is a, a candidate for TAVI or uh, has uh, more morbidity complications of TAVI than surgical procedure. So a proper assessment, CT assessment is important. With uh, other modalities like uh, TE, uh, helpful during the procedures to rule out any uh, immediate complications. Uh, there are various apps which have developed based on uh, the, the CT findings, which can be put up into this app, like a three mensure app, which will give you a detailed analysis of the annulus, the valve size, the implementation angle, uh, the whole way, the way, the aorta, how it is, the excess uh, arteries. Uh, the calcium load in those access arteries, whether we should go in for contralateral access or we should think about alternative access. So this knowledge is very important and can be derived based on CT autogram and through these various apps that are currently available. Thank you for that answer. Moving on to the next question. How does patient age impact the decision to choose PAVR over surgical aortic valve replacement? There are very clear indications, guidelines from European society, from AHA, but uh, where the patient, as, as the initial slides I had shown that patients, especially if you look at age, uh, any the TAVI was meant for patients more than 75 uh, years and sour surgical intervention was per patient less than 75 years. But in Indian scenario, I think we are uh, pushing the boundaries, uh, pushing, pushing our goalpost uh, more aggressively. And uh, we have been implanting valves in case of uh, uh, patients which are 60 years plus. So we are looking at, and that's the reason we have to look forward with increasing our, our uh, uh, better life uh, age index now that uh, we are going to end up with the valve in valve or tavi, tower in a tower in future age because these patients after when they come if you implant a valve in the age of 60 they are going to come back at the age of 70 and we'll have to think about putting up a valve in a valve tavi in tavi which will have its own challenges and complications about occlusions and other so right now, as I said, uh, current indications restrict us for using this TAVI while above 75. Uh, the, we have to look into the frailty index. We have to see about other comorbidities. If the patient is very, very morbid, very mor um, uh, and the mortality for surgical intervention is very high, then those patients, those candidates should be given an options of uh, TAVI. Well said. My last question to you is, sir, how does valve-in-valve TAVR work for patients with degenerated bioprosthetic valve? 
This is uh, uh, another area which is uh, where this Tavi wall is being actively used. Uh, fair amount of walls are there in the, which are uh, bioprosthetic wall, surgically implanted, uh, uh, stented walls, uh, which have degenerated. And these patients normally, uh, because uh, of a good long-term uh, um, uh, results of uh, surgical interventions, uh, come back now in an age of 70, 75 years. So these are a perfect candidates for putting them on for a valve in valve for a surgical sour tower in a sour, as I said, surgical uh, trans catheter valve into a surgical valve. Now, as we are pushing our boundaries, people have been putting uh, even uh, trans catheter valve into a younger age group into a surgical valve. So it is an evolving technology and it's been very rapidly, uh, very, uh, very much used nowadays, uh, uh, a tower valve in a sour valve. This brings us to the end of the session. Thank you, sir, for taking out time and efforts in putting together this interesting session. I'm sure it will help our doctors to understand TAVR better. To our dear viewers, thank you so much for attending the session. Do share any more questions if you have. Until we see you again, take care and happy dog flicks.